All right, I have 931. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Mark Suodolik and Lon Winters. Lon Winters will be our presenter today. He's going to take us from design all the way to a print. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat. Or if you'd like, you can actually uh, share your audio and video and come in live with uh, uh, questions, verbal questions. So just let us know if you have any questions or comments and please feel free to be interactive as much as you would like. Um, Lon, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Um, 45 minutes is probably a pretty short time to, to tell the whole story from, from design to print, so it'll probably be abbreviated in many sections. Um, a lot of what we'll, we'll try to do is focus on the software that uh, GSG represents as uh, uh, Separation Studio 4. Version 4, we'll spend some time doing some separations within uh, um, that software, and, and I'll bring it up kind of live and we'll go through that. Um, but we'll kind of take you through uh, pieces and parts uh, from, the, from the very beginning, kind of, uh, I like to, to tell stories. I've been writing a, a continuous column for uh, with Graphics Pro, formerly Printware, for 20-some years. It's one of the longest-running uh, columns that our industry has had for a very long time, so I'm kind of proud of that. But we, I, I like to tell stories every month, which are basically a, a job that we ran into, and here's how we solved it, fixed it, or, or ran through it. And uh, this, kind of, this story is kind of fun. Um, basically... Uh, um, I'll hold this up and I'll show pictures a little bit later. Um, the story is about Freaky Tiki. Um, I'll start that in just a minute. We ran in one a couple of different colors. We'll hold those up as we as we kind of move through it. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me and our company, Lon, of course, with Graphic Elephants. Uh, our we have a studio in uh, Cowtown in Elizabeth, Colorado. Um, uh, mostly centered on screen printing, uh, full state-of-the-art operation that, that it was built to do R&D benchmarking. Um, of course, uh, the downturn in 2007-8, the, in, uh, we did kind of convert to doing some full package types of things as well. Um, so we do, uh, we're in the ink all the time. We also do uh, some consulting work, educational kind of work, coaching and that kind of thing. Um, been doing it since the late 80s. Um, I guess it's too late to be a doctor, so we, we started getting pretty good at it. Uh, I got a really good team um, that we've been able to kind of stay together through this crazy time. Um, I call them my executive staff, so I'll give a shout out to my right-hand man, Jay, uh, Jason, uh, Ken, my wife, Janie, Bridget, uh, John. They, they all uh, work really hard for us and have, uh, have done an awful lot during these uh, this crazy COVID period as well. So. Really appreciate their their help. Um, we do do a lot of, of R and D work and benchmarking, as I mentioned, and um, a lot of the, the manufacturers and, and um, products that GSG carries. And I always I always joke that the cool kids play together at the end of the day. Um, so we basically use uh, almost all the products and materials that GSG represents. And of course, you know that that we've had a uh, 12 14 year relationship with them as well. Um, and we. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the SOS program that, that Mark and I uh, uh, do with with customers uh, throughout the the uh, GSG territory. So uh, look that up when you get a chance as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully I get this right. So you should see a puppy, right? You got it, Lon. All right, that's a 75-pound 10-year-old husky now. <laughs> His name is Bear. Now I'm going to bring up, oops, not quite ready for that. So I'm going to jump back and forth between a couple of videos and, and uh, the software. Um, I'm just going to cue this up. Now you should see our logo, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, I present this next part almost all of my uh, presentations. I call it my Einstein bit, um, and I'll explain that in just a second. Um, I, 
the Einstein bit is basically at the end of the day, I find that the uh, the screen printing is like the ultimate balance of mathematics, science, and art. You can never take the the voodoo and uh, the witchcraft out of it because we all do things our own way, um, and and it is art driven. But there's so much math and science, and, and a lot of it's pretty simple math. And if you can understand the math, begin to wrap your arms around uh, some of the the uh, processes and the details and the variables within it then you can start to actually control it uh, and control pieces of it. And the more you control, the more you want to control. And that really lends the ability to really think outside the box and really do some interesting and, and exciting and fun things. And Mark's gonna give a presentation here shortly on some special effects. And really, once you do the, the specialty items and, and the advanced techniques, all those advanced techniques, and I'm sure Mark would agree, are all based on doing the basics really well. So it's all about doing, uh, building a real solid foundation, as silly as it sounds. And if I, I see another presentation on how to print white ink on dark, I mean, I'm, I, we're all tired of that, but that is the foundation. If we can print a good white printer or under base, then a, a lot of the specialty applications, a lot of the sim process, a lot of those kinds of, of more advanced techniques uh, really come to you once you start to dial in quite literally the foundation of the business. So um, I like to think it's a, a, a balance of math and, and art. And my good friend, Michelle Moxley says it's it's the space between math and art. So I think that's pretty heavy and deep. So I dig it once she starts. So let's go back to our uh, uh, Tiki here. And quite honestly, a lot of our images start as pencil drawing. Um, now, I, I joke about it. It's old school with a K, you know, old school. Um, and we still do a lot of that where we, we sketch our ideas and put together uh, uh, on onion skin paper or, or trace or, or build kind of our, our compositions on, on paper. Um, today, with the larger Wacom tablets, um, we, can, we can build a lot of sketches and, and pen and ink on our Wacom tablets, uh, which are, is kind of it, it streamlines the workflow and, and cuts a step out. We would normally sketch and then pen and ink and then scan and then color. Um, and in this case, sometimes we can start with a real rough sketch on a, on a bar napkin. We know that a lot of our camera ready art back in the day came on a bar napkin. Today's version, uh, digital version is a Word document, but we still get bar napkins as our, our concepts. But now when we're building original art, we can actually do our, our true pencil sketches uh, on a Wacom tablet with different brushes and line weights and um, with different pressures. It takes a bit to actually really dial in or, or get the feel for, for those tablets, um, but you really can cut a step out of the workflow. Um, and in this case, our, our, our Freaky Tiki started out as a, as a sketch uh, on the Wacom tablet, and then we clean him up um, so he's a, a real a clean black line. And then in Illustrator, we actually just lay in color. Um, this could be done in, in any vector program, um, Illustrator or Corel. Uh, we choose Illustrator uh, mostly because we work a lot in Photoshop, and Illustrator and Photoshop talk really nicely together. Um, it's just our preference. Uh, you can do the same thing in, in Corel. Uh, some people prefer it as it's a little cheaper to get in, into in the first place, um, but they basically do the same things. Um, so we lay in flat color, and then the volume in a sim process job comes in Photoshop where we use our brushes and, and start to airbrush in the volume. Um, and we always talk to, in when we're teaching people kind of the, the, the basics of sim process, if you can remember back when you took an art class in, in high school or college or, or even uh, uh, primary school, when you would set up a still life with the, the spheres and the, uh, uh, the, the discs and the cones and set a, a, a bright light source on one side. And when you would uh, sketch in pencil or charcoal, you would you'd put a, a bright white light on one side and a heavy shadow on the other side. Um, and the more dramatic you built that, the more dramatic you actually visualize that, the better the still life was, because that's the idea behind 
some processes is a bright light source on one side and a heavy shadow on the other, and then possibly a secondary light source with just a, a, a flash on the other side. And if you can think of these things as you begin to add volume as that sphere or that, that cone that you drew in, in high school, that really does lend, lend the idea to creating the heavy shadow and, and, and not only just using black and white, because we're using multiple colors within this, we can use darker tones for shadows, lighter tones for highlights and, and everything in between. So we've got our vector image on the left and our, our uh, tonal image on the right. And it's purely simple, simply a matter of, of adding light and shadow if you think about it. So when you take the, the face here, you can see we've just added black. Now, we're gonna design this and, and we built this for black. And in a lot of ways, we don't print black um, generally. And I don't say that just because i am got a big ego. I, that's, that's a problem as well. But I, I say that we, we don't print black, black mostly so we can have another screen. If I don't have to print black, then I can add another purple or another green or another blue um, to, to create additional color. So if I don't have to print black, I try not to uh, when we're designing for black. We do build it in Photoshop because we have to create that shadow and that and the uh, the depth within the image. So this was our our composition at the end, and I'll. I think it turned out really nice, but there's a couple of things that that I'll say about it. When we design for sim process, and and this this makes a uh, uh, this is a kind of a a must. If you're designing a building for black and for sim process, we want a lot of negative space. We want a lot of black show through, not only on the shadow, but we want negative space. And you can see it in some of the areas that we have some black show through. But in hindsight, I would say that we probably want to add even more black show through. It, it lends itself to not only the, the drama and the dramatic effect of the, of the image, but it also lends to a softer hand. So by the time we, we are we print the white and the colors on top of it, we, you can add extra hand. Uh, and ultimately the idea to send processes is, is, you, is you're trying to, to create a reasonably soft hand and drape. Uh, and that's sometimes difficult to do when you cover the whole uh, canvas. And this uh, Corey Gray did this design and he's uh, our best illustrator. And like any good artist, you tell him you got a 16 by 22 canvas, he's gonna use every bit of it. Um, so together we work really well in that if we go back say okay we need more black let's let's increase some some more negative space we're doing a project for aviant group next week um, and we're doing a bunch of sim process jobs and we're going to go back through all the designs and introduce more black uh, more negative space so the same can be uh, applied if this was printing on on say red we could knock the red out of the image and use the shirt so ultimately, instead of thinking of, of, of doing, when we screen print, we're gonna bury the substrate. We wanna think of, of embracing it and, and using the substrate to help our design and, and, and help our hand and help our drape uh, all at the same time. So I'm gonna back out of this. Um, just to give you a little backdrop on the image, the, this is originally built for Avian Group and Wilflex. We did a, uh, uh, a promotion, and I, I believe it's hanging up in, in Mark's print lab there, um, with with Wilflex for Long Beach last year, and and the the theme was surf. So that was the direction. We get a little weird when we get direction. The theme being surf, we quickly turned to to a tiki. So we took the the colorful tiki and uh, converted him for promotion for freehand graphics, and that's where the story comes in. Freehand graphics is the manufacturer of uh, separation studio, which we're going to demo here in just a second. And so we repurposed it for a promotion called summer of winters. And, uh, ultimately we were flattered that, that, uh, Charlie and the, and the gang there at uh, freehand asked us to, to be part of this promotion. And this was kind of a signature shirt that they, uh, bundled with some of their film packages and stuff. So that was the idea and why we ended up with the summer of winters, uh, promotion. So from there, Let's open up our Tiki. So 
I hate it when I work with customers and I'll ask them a question. So why do you do something the way you do it? And they don't have an answer other than it's the way we've always done it. Um, it infuriates me other than I'm going to go to that right here. I like saving my images in the software as a TIFF because it's the way we've always done it. <laughs> However, I say that, and the reason uh, in 1995, this, this software cost $15,000. Um, it was way less robust, way less intuitive, a lot harder to use, um, but it was uh, at the time the best thing available. Um, and it would only open TIFFs. So we learned back then opening TIFFs. Today, as you can see, it'll open a lot of different um, file names. But through habit and through a little bit of experience here, we found that it likes TIFFs. Every now and again, you'll open an EPS or a PSD or a, a PDF, and for some reason it gets confused and something happens and it takes forever and it says it's a giant file. Um, so it mostly works on all those uh, file extensions, but for some reason it seems to like the TIFF. So let's open that up. So the software, let me give you a little bit of a why here. Um, if there's Photoshop users out there right now going, oh, I'd never use a, a plugin or a, a, a software package like this. And, and uh, we use it a lot, but we also uh, work in Photoshop a lot. Um, and at the, at the very least, if you look at this software as a meat grinder, all of these at the bottom here are channels. And I can reopen this in Photoshop if I want and reconfigure them in Photoshop. This has some nice features that you can work outside of Photoshop. It's the only kind of a separation program that works outside of Photoshop rather than being inside of Photoshop. And there's goods and bads about uh, either way. Uh, we can teach this real easy. Photoshop, you, it takes a bit to know what you're doing inside of Photoshop. Um, it's a powerful, powerful t uh, software that can do anything this does. It just takes longer and you've got to learn more uh, to, to make sense of it. I like this because I'm a process guy and I'm a screen print guy and it speaks my language. I, all these at the bottom, I look at as screens. These are, this is ink. That's just red ink. This is my white base, my under base, my white printer. And I can visualize that as my, my white on black. The other thing that I like about it is I can also view it as film. I can't see anymore, sorry about that. Um, I can view it as film. This is super film or output uh, for those CTS and uh, digital to screen, digital direct to screen guys. This is output. I can, I can visualize this. I can make sense of this when I'm going to press. So we jump back and forth a lot between Photoshop and, and the software. So the meat grinder part of this, I don't spend the time it takes to go in and color pick and, and figure out which screens which or which inks to use, how many colors it's going to be, all those kinds of things. This is really a bunch of actions that does the same thing over and over, um, which is really quite uh, at the very least, it gives us a bunch of masks that we can use. We're actually working together, uh, Corey and I, on this project for Aviant next week. We're going to run it through the meat grinder so we can develop a bunch of masks. And then Corey's going to work in Photoshop and we'll tweak some things, for lack of better terms. That's a technical term in our industry uh, in Photoshop. And, and we'll come up with kind of the best of both worlds type of thing. So ultimately, let me go back and run through our workflow. So it, every time, jams into these nine plates. And if you notice, they're primaries and secondaries. So ultimately, if I don't have a 10 color, I'm in trouble, right? But it just does this so that we have the data. All of this is nothing but data. Uh, and ultimately, it'll turn to output and ink, but that data may or may not be 100% correct, but I can always move from plate to plate and I'll show you how that kind of goes. So our workflow would be every time we would run through and hit our auto adjust, and that's relatively new on the last couple of versions. And what that does is just beef up the underbase and beef up all the colors. Now, I could go directly to press with this and probably get reasonably good results. I typically like to work outside of the auto adjust 
just because sometimes, oops, and I can hit that multiple times, sometimes it blows out some of the color to the point where I can't work with it anymore. I can't pull it back or I can't increase uh, sections of it, whether in the software or in, in Photoshop. So unless I have a 10 color press, I can't run nine colors, right? So ultimately there's a, a couple of things that we'll run through. So unless I'm printing an elephant, and I say that because I'm graphic elephants, but also because elephants are gray, we usually don't print gray. Um, it, when I merge it, it'll actually put it on the highlight white and, and create a gray just printing directly on, on black. Um, the only time I'd want to run a gray, the elephant could be chrome or it could be something that has a lot of gray tones in it or mid tones in it. Now, the other thing that the gray is useful for is it doesn't have to print gray. Let's say we're, we're making a, an apple, go back to your, your still life. That gray could actually be, say, a, a mid tone maroon or red type color um, that's going to give me a smoother transition. So there's data there that I don't necessarily always want to get rid of, but in, in many cases I would. So we'd merge that away. We could merge the, oops, I can't see still. We could merge the purple away. That's going to put it on the blue and red. And you can see the image changing slightly, but not all that much. And we can even merge away our turquoise. And that flattens our blue an awful lot. So maybe I don't want to merge away my turquoise. Let's go back and bring that back. But now I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors. Um, maybe I only have a, uh, a six color manual. So I could maybe run, let's run my green and my turquoise as the same plate. And this is a, re re a new feature on four where you can drag and drop. So now I can pick a different color maybe for that turquoise uh, that's closer to green. So now I'm down to those six plates. I can fit that on a six color manual or on a uh, six color diamondback with a, a flash in the takeoff station. Or I could even choose to turn off my highlight white and print flash print my first white. Or there's, there's really a lot of ways that I can compress this thing down to as few as say five colors. Um, in this case, we got a little carried away because we can. Um, it's not necessarily what we would do all the time, but I'm going to show you a few tricks that we have found really useful. So let's reopen them again. So one of the things that we do a lot of, we call it splitting the whites. So if I duplicate that, and I want to look at those as film. So why would I split the whites? Um, and we do this uh, a lot if we're doing uh, like photorealism. So my white is, uh, as you know, it's always that that's the magic. If my white works or looks pretty good on on black, then I've got a pretty good sim process print. The uh, but if I wanted to, let's say I, I had a, a, a photorealistic image with a lot of real subtle uh, uh, transitions, and this is a water based technique, and, and this works both with plastisol and water based. But basically, we want our light colors to have a big punch of white underneath them, we want our mid tones to more fall back a little bit, and then we want our dark tones to drop off. So it, Traditionally, if I want a bright white, I'd probably run this, say, on a, a 156 range, 150, 160 range um, to get my bright white. But as you know, when we, we expose, say, a, a 55 line halftone on, a, on a, uh, a 156, we might get a more A or the bottom end drops off completely. So what we would do is take this white and put it on a high mesh. Let's run it on a 230 or a 305. Uh, put that on a high mesh so we can hold nearly everything. And we're going to cut our ink, say, in half with halftone extender. So it's more or less going to print like a gray. So it's just we're going to get every single halftone, even these uh, uh, small percentages here. And then we'll take our second white and we'll adjust that. And this is what's nice about the software here is we can beef up all the areas that we want to make sure that 
our bright, our yellow areas, our bright white areas. And then we'll take the top end off because we're going to introduce that in the, we call it a soft white. So now we have a soft white for all our detail areas and our transitions, and we have a hard white for for the, the bright areas, and this can be on a lower mesh. So we have a hard white and a soft white, and we print them wet on wet. So that first white is going to basically be gray, second white nice and bright. And we can do the same thing on the top end, our highlight white. We call this a blending white. So if we had a bunch of pastel colors, um, you can we're not going to get a field full of pastel flowers, uh, light pink and light lavender with these primary colors. So in order to build the primary or the uh, pastel colors, we call this a blending white. Again, we would cut it with, with halftone extenders so it's tra translucent. So if you're a painter, you, you would think of this as like a blending white. So it's almost transparent. It's gonna give you those nice pastel purples. If you look at the surfboard, that's how we're getting the pastel purple on the surfboard. But with that being transparent and on a high mesh again, we're not getting our bright whites. So we'd take our, we'd do the same thing, take that top end off and beef up our bottom end. And I'm arbitrarily doing this. I'd spend a little more time on it. But now you can see all the really bright white areas like his teeth, we're going to be able to do that on a bit of a lower mesh or a, um, a, a more opaque white to get those bright white areas to go. Now, I'm not saying we used four white screens on this job, and we would rarely use four white screens. Um, but we might use the blending white and the highlight white um, on, on a particular application or the, the soft white, hard white on the underbases. And the same thing can be done with blacks because this is what happened to us. Uh, let's say that the customer loved the print and then decided, you know what, that would look really cool on fluorescent orange, wouldn't it? Can we do a dozen fluorescent orange? Remember, because we're such great printers, we don't print black. Oops, boy, did I really screw up. Now this isn't gonna work, right? So I can generate blacks here and there's three different ones, and we typically will generate all of them for one particular reason here, and I'll show you. And again, all this can be done in Photoshop, of course, but it's just gonna take longer. So we have three different blacks. One's called a sharper, one's called a detailed, one called a skeletal. You can see that the skeletal is just that, it's sort of the key line. The sharper introduces all of the shadow areas and the detailed is some, something in the middle. Now again, on this particular image, I wanna use the sharper black, oops, I'm sorry, the sharper black as my, my to introduce the shadow areas on this orange. In fact, I'm going to move it to the very front of the print order. And that's another new feature is the drag and drop piece of it, which is really nice. And then I'm gonna also cut that with halftone extender. So it's more of a dark gray charcoal to introduce my shadow areas. And then I'm gonna use the key line black towards the end. Actually, let's put it between the two whites here. So the sharper being in the middle was just basically a, um, a black in the middle. I wouldn't use that on this one. But again, I can use that for my shadow areas on this orange color and then my, my hard black areas that have to be black. The problem with running a, a soft black as your key line is it's not gonna be hard that might, you know, black, black, it's gonna have show through. So this just gives us flexibility in the way that we can split this. So you can see all of a sudden this thing can get pretty darn complicated um, and it doesn't need to be. And I recommend this for people that don't do a lot of sim process and they get photographic type of work. Check out what you can do with, this thing is a grayscale. 
So we can turn all the colors off. Look what a great grayscale we get. Now we're not going to print three blacks, and but let's turn off. And this under base. Not that one. So now we've got one under base, one black, a highlight white, and a gray. We could actually turn off the gray. Now we're down to three colors. We could even turn off the highlight white down to two colors. And it's a nice grayscale with two colors on that on that garment color. But let's go back to our black. We could even turn off our skeletal white. And even with one screen, we have a nice grayscale. So in a lot of times, especially on smaller presses, if you get if you have a customer that wants photographic type of work, um, if you can talk them into a grayscale, they'll be way happier than butchering a full color image that you can't get either because you just don't have the experience or secondly, you, uh, you don't have enough heads to do a photograph. So a lot of times a grayscale um, and it's just a push of a button and, and you don't have you don't print the rest of the plates um, to give you that grayscale. So let's kind of finish up here. I know we're and again to emphasize, all of these are are uh, channels. So everything can anything you do in Photoshop or in uh, Separation Studio, you can go back and forth. I mentioned use it as a meat grinder to build all of these data plates, these these output plates, and all of them can be manipulated and moved um, to different areas, or you can use uh, your curves or whatever, whatever your thing is inside of Photoshop, change to PMS colors, and then reopen it in the software for a soft proof. So even if you use it as a meat grinder to give you some more masks and some more data, and then looking at uh, this piece of it as the soft proof uh, piece of it, it becomes a great tool. Oh, I didn't want to say that, my bad. So I want to bring back up a little so we're back to a logo here. And then I'll kind of, this is a bit of a, a video, but I'll, I'll kind of stop it in, in a couple of spots and explain a few more things. Um, and I have the, the specs on this. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to, to post them or, or send them to GSG. Um, and you guys can, can uh, take a look at the specs. I'll, I'll briefly go through them. I can. Okay, why am I not? Don't you love the... Oh, that's why. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, back to my logo and terrible photo there, but we use high tension screens, uh, numeral frames. These were all at 45 Newtons. Um, we automatically coat so that we can, uh, can get consistent stencils. This is a sped up eye image. I wish it ran that fast. It's actually uh, reasonably fast when you sped it up for these reasons. Um, the output, as we get through this, we uh, on this one we went 55 line, and let's let's discuss output real quick here. When we get to the end of this, um, we set our frequency. We have uh, settings on this eye image anywhere from 10 LPI all the way to 85 LPI, um, and there, it's 
you don't look at it as some type of limiting factor, and it doesn't make, again, back to my ego, we can hold 85 LPI when we have to do photographic stuff with really tiny imagery inside the chrome, let's say. Um, I want to just stop it here. So, um, and that ultimately is about as high as we can go. But if you think about it, if you don't need that frequency, why put yourself through it? Um, we don't really have a default. We, we pick the frequency. If we're doing a, uh, an illustrative image like this, uh, we'll pick between 35 and 55. 35 sometimes gives you a really neat texture and you can see the dots. And, and sometimes the dots are, they lend to the look, especially a cartoony illustrative type of uh, image. Um, 55 is probably a good default. You can run between 230 and 305 at a 55 LPI. And then 45 sort of in the middle and then 65 you start working towards a, a more photographic tonal uh, look. And then on the very bottom end we'll use a, a 10 LPI uh, just for fun to give it a, a really wicked texture and knock out because uh, you can literally see the dots about the size of the end of your, your uh, pinky. Um, this is this is just the output of, of the tiki, and you can see um, that it's it's the dots are pretty darn. Uh, I I hesitate to say the word hard. They're not hard like a image set or piece of film would be, but they're reasonable. Um, we've done some pretty nice photographic work uh, using the eye image and, and its output, but you can see it's a a, a pretty good uh, half tone output there. Um, we also use a, kind of a default uh, 22 and a half degree angle. That's to, to uh, minimize uh, interference in moray. Uh, that 22 and a half is right in between, say, 0 and 45, which would, or 90. Those angles are going to give you the least interference on your, on your mesh. Um, and then we also choose the round dot on the eye image because the output is a bit oblong, almost an oval. Um, so ultimately, the uh, the output was 22 and a half, 55 LPI, and uh, uh, round. And this is Ken setting up to the Trilock on a Gauntlet 2. This ended up being 13 screens, which was a, a little bit obnoxious, but again, um, it was kind of a uh, a, a signature show type piece. So we, uh, we did some splitting of the screens. We added a couple of fluorescent colors. Um, I wish Ken worked this up just a little bit. And this isn't the Trisync, which is the lighted version, which is really clever as well, which I really like. Um, and I'm missing a file. Sorry about that. So we drop our inks in. We did run three whites on this. You can see these are the primary colors, the secondary colors, and a couple of flows. And this is the first strike off. I'm not going to lie. We practiced this a little bit before we video. But 13 screens without looking through them on, uh, without any setup. Uh, in a traditional manner. One flash. Those are our two whites you saw that we split. We've got the action roller here to smooth it. Um, we might actually use the uh, uh, hothead iron or roller there as well, depending on the space. We ran the brown early because we didn't really care how bright it was. We just needed it to be brown. And you can see that some of the darker colors run early. As we get to the more bright colors, they run later. And they recommend on the software that you start with their called print order, but trust your instincts. Um, we know that flows are going to be sticky and want to uh, lift off, so we run those towards the end of the print order. Um, we choose the, the most important colors uh, towards the end, the highlight white at the end, um, golds and yellows at the, uh, towards the end. Here's a, a flow yellow, the very last color before the highlight white. 
And with the tension level, you can see, see that the, the squeegees are running at a 10 degree angle. We don't we like to use the edge on, on these. Um, they're all uh, 65, 90, 65s. And that's the first strike off, 13 screens, absolutely no that's micro that's needed. First strike off, try lock registration. And here's just a little bit of production we'll show you. On that's uh, one flash of uh, the underbase and everything else is wet on wet? It is, the, uh, the soft and hard white act as the underbase and then everything else is wet on wet. I showed I showed the the black and the orange shirt, and of course, what we did to make the orange shirt, like I mentioned in the in the, uh, in the separation piece of it, is we dropped the orange and removed the underbase from it, and then added the blacks so that we could still fit it on the press. So it was basically 15 screens. Two of them switched out for the black and the orange. And that's kind of the, the story from design to print. And we ran, I think we ran about 1,200 of them. And we ran uh, several hundred for Kevin at Wilflex uh, before it was repurposed as well. So there's a bunch of them out there. We made a textured version of him too, um, where we added a couple of plates of high density uh, under him and uh, an HD clear over and made some real interesting uh, textures in just the mask piece of it. So that, that's my executive team. I always got to talk about them because they're awesome. I wouldn't be here without them. And that's our story. And I'm going to stop presenting now. Excellent job. Do you have any questions for us? And I need a haircut. You look great. <laughs> you look great. How was that? How'd I do? You did great. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we sign off? I don't see anything coming up. We've got about uh, two, three minutes before our time is up. Nothing. No, I think you did great, though. We made it from design to print. Mm -hmm. We did. That's a lot of stuff to cover in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I probably left a whole bunch out. <laughs> okay, I think that's good then. We'll go ahead and sign off. Uh, make sure you uh, check into the rest of our sessions throughout today um, and let us know if we can help you in any way going forward. Wait, wait, I think we have a separation studio question coming in. What time is the keynote, and that that's going to be a? I think it's noon. One. Yeah, I believe it's noon? noon. I think each day they had it at noon. Awesome. Well, I think we have a question. There it is. No. Yeah, I believe we're going to have recorded sessions that we can send out. So from what I've been told, I believe they're going to uh, give us uh, links that we can send out to customers because I believe everything has been recorded. I don't know when we will have that. Um, yes, we, we will have them available. Oh, I see one quick question. Um, how, are, uh, how are we adding uh, registration marks through Step Studio to DTS? We're actually, we hang it on uh, the DCS2 file on an Illustrator uh, artboard that has our pre-registration marks as well as a, a, a grayscale. Uh, and so we output through Illustrator rather than straight out of Photoshop. If that helps. Okay. That way everything has the same, uh, the same artboard. The only thing we move is the bottom registration mark, center mark. And then in a lot, uh, Depending on the image, a lot of our vector stuff, we take that all off so that we don't have to worry about taping it out, particularly if we're on water base. Um, but in, when you're working with all those half tones, it's nice to have a, a target so you're not chasing things around with no idea how it 
how it works. But yeah, just set up a template. It's it's more or less a template that that has two registration marks at the top, one on the bottom, and a grayscale at the top. And then depending on the the height of the image, that one is the only thing that moves. That then all of your template systems on your palettes, manual, auto, uh, they're they're all the same that way. Great. Any more questions before we go? Thank you, Lon, so much for your uh, presentation. Um, I think it was very good. Um, so we'll go ahead and sign off now. Make sure you uh, check into the rest of our sessions throughout the day. And thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.